the railway revolution to advance Australia and the twisted fraud justifying war in the name of democracy. Coming up on today's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 16th of September 2022. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, we're going to be discussing a breakthrough for rail development across Australia, finally, and a project which uh, was a key element in pushing this new so called rules based order that we're now all hostage to. Now, don't forget, if you like the show, hit the like button. That'll help circulate it. Subscribe and ring the notification bell to be informed of uh, upcoming shows, new shows and also additional content that we regularly put out. And share it as widely as you can through social media and so forth. And comment as well um, and add to the ongoing debate. Now, before we get into the first topic today, a couple of uh, updates on our various campaigns to discuss Firstly, uh, of course, as everyone that watches this show regularly would be aware, last week was a historic forum held in Parliament House in Canberra, hosted by the Licensed Post Office Group and um, addressed by former Cabinet Minister from New Zealand, Matt Robson, who was on the show last week, uh, and a number of members of Parliament, three MPs, addressed that forum, calling for uh, Australia Post to uh, take on banking take a role in banking. Now, as an, by way of update on that, uh, of course, Bob Catter is um, the federal MP who's putting forward the legislation, the bill, which is ready to go for that proposal. Uh, and his son, Queensland State MP Robbie Catter, just put out this brilliant little, just a minute or so, video promo for the uh, Postal Bank. He introduced it with a tweet saying, why a government-owned bank? Well, I'm glad you asked. So last week in Canberra, there was a big push for the post office bank, which would be a government bank that would operate out of the post offices around Australia. And what that aims to address is to fill that gap in the marketplace left by the big banks. The big banks have exited most of west of Queensland in some way. And they've they either closed the buildings, but a lot of the lending as well. They're just not offering loans there. The KAP has had as a foundation policy since its inception a government bank to play a role in the development of Queensland and the broader regional Australia. And that's because uh, at the centre point of economic development is access and availability and affordability of capital. And the big banks have told us they just won't want to operate in these areas anymore. So we need to have a government bank to fill that gap. And the good news about that is for taxpayers, it's a policy initiative that makes the taxpayer money. And there's not many of those around that make you money. So it's, it's business the banks don't want. Post offices can do it. It's been done in New Zealand right now, and the KOP is strongly supporting this push in Canberra at the moment. And uh, because we put two bills in Parliament before ourselves in that same way to provide a government bank. So there you go. That was a great little uh, uh, yep. demonstration there out the front of a post office somewhere in an isolated part of Queensland, probably. Um, in his area, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's. You know, we need that kind of activity. So the more you can um, visit your MP, ring your MP, email your MP and push this idea. Uh, of course, we have now five councils that have passed motions. These are local um, municipalities that have discussed and voted on um, the proposal and to lobby the federal government to go with this proposal to turn Australia Post into a postal bank to alleviate especially the problem of so many uh, bank branches shutting down in regional areas. And uh, just on the eve of that Postal Bank Forum last week, Strathfield City Council in Sydney became the fifth council to pass that through. Fifth of many, hopefully, Elisa. I mean, we're about to, the Citizens Party's about to embark on a, on a major campaign to contact every single council and councillor in the country in the coming weeks. Yes. So if you're a councillor watching this, you can expect to receive emails from us uh, and uh, you know requests for uh, well we'll offer mm. to speak to any council 
about uh, what a postal bank means. Mm. And there's all sorts of interesting things that will come through that email. Yeah, and we'll put a link in the info box below where you can click to see the media release we put out this week telling you what you can do um, and finding out further information of how you can organise your councils around this issue. Everything mm -hmm. that you need is there. Um, now, on the same topic, um, we've just been informed of a parliamentary petition uh, to which we have about 20 days to um, really rack up a lot of signatures before this parliament, this petition gets presented to the parliament. This was initiated by Dale Webster from the regional, of course, as we've spoken about on the show many times. Dale, who also participated in the forum in Canberra last week, uh, has documented, which APRA should do, but of course they haven't, um, and they've been... Um, They've actually covered up the extent of the bank branch closures. So she's done the documentation. She's a winner of Quill and Walkley Awards. Um, so she put together this petition. I just want to read it out. And everyone, again, we'll put the link below, should click on this and sign this and circulate it to other people. So we really hit Canberra hard with this in the coming days. So it calls for a moratorium on regional bank closures and a new inquiry. It says, private research shows regional Australia has lost 62% of its banks since 1975, leaving just 1,062 located mainly in clusters in larger centres. The number of towns and cities with a bank has shrunk from 1,226 to 386. 575 towns that once had one or more major banks now have no form of bank at all. Another 146 towns are on the brink of complete loss of banking services with just one major bank open. Last year, regional Australia lost 113 big four bank branches. Locations included 45 towns that were stripped of their last or only bank. Of these, 23 did not, uh, did not have a minor corporate mutual or franchise bank to fall back on. If a similar 10% cut to the branch network is made this year, 100 more branches will be lost in the next seven months. 50 towns will lose their last bank. This issue has not been looked at properly for 17 years. The Morrison government set up a task force into regional banking as a pre-election stunt, but only put representatives of the banking industry and its own politicians on it. Just one public meeting was held. Findings have not yet been delivered. The petition request is... We therefore ask the House to impose an immediate moratorium on regional bank closures, launch a new inquiry to pick up from where Money Too Far Away 1999 and Money Matters in the Bush 2004 left matters and pulp any reports that come from the Coalition's task force uh, and calls on people to sign the petition. So, Yeah, and a very important release. I just heard anecdotally this week that the ANZ Bank in Kingaroy, which is where the Citizens Party originally was founded you know, mm. 34 years ago, is closing down. Mm. And the effect of that is that uh, if you want to get into any of the other banks that are actually in town, it's up to a three week wait to have an appointment with a banker. Uh, that's what's happened. Jeez. Because the, every everyone who, that was with the ANZ is now moving to, another, to the banks that I are mean, still there. How are we supposed to run a functioning economy? Mm. in any region of the country when that's the case. That's right. And this is, the, um, this is, this is the, the sort of like the hidden reality of what happens when you take a bank. Yeah. All the other banks get more customers, yes, but the services get stretched. Mm. No, and we're going to talk about the implications of that kind of banking desert uh, as we go into our next segment, which we'll do now. So please sign that petition. The railway revolution to advance Australia. Now, we had a breakthrough... Um, another breakthrough last week in addition to the Postal Bank Forum and that is that One Nation put up a motion for a parliamentary inquiry, that was the 5th of September, um, which passed without opposition, it passed on the voices um, to get an inquiry into this project known as Iron Boomerang. Um, so for people who've never heard of that... Yeah, this, that is this is basically linking the east and the west of the country across the top from the iron ore rich Pilbara regions to the uh, coal rich uh, Bowen Basin regions in North Queensland, link the two together uh, and build steel mills mm, on, each, yeah. on, each, on each side. That's yeah. right. And so we can actually steel. be producing the steel ourselves for yeah. export and not just selling all the raw material that we dig up overseas. Um, now we're going to let uh, Malcolm Roberts, One Nation Senator who put this motion up, explain it a little more and we're also going to play a clip um, of Glenn, Senator Glenn Stirl from the ALP in Western Australia um, 
you know, voicing his, you know, very um, adamant support for this project. Madam Acting Deputy President, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, Project Iron Boomerang is an exciting and visionary project that can make our country's north and make our whole country. Project Iron Boomerang's main elements are a 3,300 kilometre transcontinental railroad with heavy duty axle capacity connecting existing rail networks in the iron ore region of the Pilbara to the existing rail networks in central Queensland. On the way, linking with the existing Darwin to Adelaide rail line to improve freight movement nationally. The essence of this project is that iron ore will be transported from west to east and those carriages then backloaded with coal to transport coal to Western Australia, hence the boomerang name. Steel blast furnaces in steel parks at both ends, in the east in the Bowen Basin of, of Queensland, in the west in the Pilbara of Western Australia, will in turn turn the iron ore and coal into steel slabs for export from Port Hedland in Western Australia and from Abbott Point and the Port of Gladstone in Queensland. Fibre optic, water, power and potentially gas lines can be laid along the rail alignment for additional commercial benefit. Project Iron Boomerang will strengthen Australia's balance of payments, lift our gross domestic product and with that lift our whole economy, restoring our national security, restoring opportunity. We have allowed too many industries to be closed and sent overseas. Too many jobs have been exported. It's time to turn that around. So I want to support, and I know the, Australian, the, the Labor Party and, and Prime Minister Albanese and the Albanese government support you, Senator Roberts, for bringing this to us. I think it's a magnificent thing. And I also think this is what we should be doing. This is the big ticket items that, when I first came into the Senate, Lo and behold, I thought we would be discussing this stuff on a daily basis. <laughs> How tricked I got. But anyway, at least let's get back to it. The big stuff about building a better nation, as I said in my first speech, and leaving it better than what we found it. I want to support this, and we will support this, Senator Roberts. And I urge and I understand the opposition hopefully will get in behind us too, because this is the stuff we need to do. And once the beauty of speaking after Senator Roberts, you've heard the whole guts and the crux of the matter. I can't pick an argument in there. There's, there's not a downside that I'd see. And the beauty of it is that I know when it comes to my committee, the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, a committee that's been predicated for all the years I've been here to put aside all the political bulldust and actually dig deep, go wide, go varied, listen to everyone who's got a thought and actually try and deliver in the best interests of our nation. Senator Roberts, I'll tip my hat to you. I look forward to joining you on the uh, tour. And let's try and put these two great industries together, iron ore in my state of WA, coal in your state of Queensland. This makes too much sense. I'm starting to get a headache because it's sounding too easy. I might wake up in a minute and think I was only dreaming. Fully support you, Senator Roberts. The Albanese government will be backing you in on this one. So, and it's, it's very interesting that um, Glenn Stirl, and he might have a fight on his hands, who knows, but he says the government will support this. I mean, he's very personally supportive. Um, so, you know, you've got this now on the table in a more um, earnest way than ever before. It's, the project, in essence, has been in one form or another around for a few decades. There was a big push for it in 2014. Um, Tony Abbott knocked it on the head for a while there. So it's back up here. Um, originally, this inquiry was set to report by January next year, which isn't very long, but that was extended. They asked for an extension, which was rapidly granted so that it lasts one year, because obviously there's a lot to examine. Malcolm Roberts um, put into the terms of re reference certain key things such as what employment would be created by this project, the benefit to Australian GDP and balance of payments from that increased productive capacity, um, what capital, energy and resources are required to build it and operate it, but you also have to look through at the feasibility of the design Obviously, what is mandatory these days is environmental benefits and things or impacts of that nature, mm. relevance to national security and any related matters. So that's all going to be topic if of discussion. If people want to really understand what this is about, very exciting. The Citizens Insight, which is on this channel, this YouTube channel, actually interviewed the uh, Glenn Isherwood interviewed the principal, Shane Condon, on Citizens Insight, where we go through in detail what this project means for Australia. It's one of the most popular videos that we have on our channel, mm. uh, Lisa, Excellent because this video. is what people, 
this is what people really want. This is why uh, the, uh, the senator from West Australia, Glenn Stirl, uh, is really uh, excited about because this is a big nation building project. Mm. This is what our country needs. Yeah. And it's look, it's all ready to go. Shane Condon and his team, his company, have done all the work. They've done all of, all of the feasibility studies. All it requires is the imprimatur of government to mm -hmm. provide the security of the uh, development precincts on either side of the railway line. Uh, and this is a max, massive railway line. I mean, it's going to run double-tracked. It's going to be potentially automated trains, high-speed trains, the latest technology of trains, you know, to, to, to minimise friction and stuff like that. Uh, very exciting stuff. And it's, then there's also the development of a shipbuilding industry, potentially, mm. to build a new class of ships to ship the what, that's what's called first stage steel mm. from either end of the country to China and to other places for further develop, mm. for further further um, uh, manufacturing. And Malcolm Roberts also, and you can watch the full video on YouTube, you'll see it probably just below this one um, where Malcolm Roberts went on in that talk that we just heard a, a little bit of, uh, that we can also mesh this in with the water projects of the Ord River scheme and so forth. So there's all kinds of really exciting potentials once you start to look at the drawing board and say, right, we've neglected the development of this country for too long, what can we do? We can fund this also through a national bank if we choose to do so. That's, you know, even the postal bank could make a contribution towards this. Uh, but there is also plenty of international, unfortunately, there's plenty of international interest in providing the funds for it as well. But we want to go down the national... Yeah, right. um, and I wanted to make that point because there's no need for Australia to um, take foreign loans. No, there's none. There's no need for us to have to court foreign investment of any kind to build this. Um, and yet, at the same time, I want to bring China into the mix here. You know, we don't you know, need to get loans from China. We don't need to get foreign investment. I mean, they're, they're reducing their foreign investment here anyway for obvious reasons. However, um, last week in Canberra, Robert Barwick from the Australian Citizens Party met with the Chinese ambassador, Xiao Qian, who told us that China is absolutely keen to cooperate with Australia in developing high-speed rail because China are absolute experts in this area. And I'll come back to that. But he also promoted this idea that Australia should be building manufacturing industries to produce things like electric vehicles and batteries because, of course, we have a rare earth minerals capacity. We're among, well, we are actually the world's top producer of lithium, rutile, and the second largest producer of zircon. Um, and we're in the top five globally of producers for antimony, cobalt, lithium, manganese ore, niobium, tungsten, and vanadium. So we've got this incredible capacity, which actually the world desperately needs um, to produce these kinds of things. And China um, doesn't, you know, they don't want to insist on us selling all their raw material. They're quite happy for us to produce it here, which was very clear from the ambassador's comments, um, because it benefits them for other nations to uplift their capacities and their standard of living. And in fact, that's what the whole Belt and Road Project was always and about. And the win-win idea. Yeah. No, this idea that one country rises and the other has to fall mm, is, not. is ridiculous. The idea is you can have both economies rising at the same time, and that's what they support. Well, they play off each other. It and benefits play, yeah. both. It's you know mutual benefit. Um, and I just wanted to mention in terms of that expertise in the high-speed rail sector mm. that China uh, now has, and we cited in the um, alert service, 36,000 kilometres, but apparently with a new section of the Beijing-Hong Kong high-speed rail network, which started operation in January, the length of the high-speed rail network in China is now 40,000 kilometres, which is the equivalent to the length of the equator. Uh, and all of this was built since 2008, which is not actually coincidental that that was the year of the global financial crisis because that's when China started publicly agitating for a new financial architecture and economic development plans that would help lift the world out of the global depression we'd created by siphoning all the funding away from the real economy into speculation, which caused the crash. Yeah. Um, so, and I just want to cite a couple of examples of the kind of rail development um, that's just being concluded just currently. 
and there's so much more. Of, of course, you couldn't go through it all, but um, I'll, I'll put video up in the background to show, for instance, this bullet train in Tibet. This rail line goes from Lhasa to Ningchi. Um, this took six years to build for $5.7 billion. It, and some of these projects in China are extremely challenging. This one, for instance, is at very high altitude, so the trains require oxygen supply, um, not unlike an airplane. And to build it as well is much more challenging. That rail line continues through to Yunnan in China. Uh, and one of the problems they experienced was tectonic movements that in less than one month caused the tunnel one of the tunnels that they're building for the train to go through to be squeezed from a diameter of 12 metres to less than three metres, oh. meaning a car could not actually pass through it or just barely. Uh, and what they quoted in South China Morning Post was that the tunnel had come under pressure as great as 30 megapascals equal to the combined weight of 75 elephants standing on a single foot. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> um, so, I mean, these are the kind of challenges. It's relatively straightforward for Australia. I mean, China's had to build a lot of railway lines through deserts, which you can see in some of the footage that's been running in the background as well. So they've got that experience. But with this particular tunnel, the engineers said it was the most challenging tunnel they ever built they're still working to complete it and are looking to drill a hole through the mountain to relieve the pressure and obviously they're not going to give up on it they're no. going to figure out the solution as you're saying that Alyssa I think about the snowy mountain scheme you know Australia was at the forefront of this type of technology yeah uh, Tunnel we, building. we developed things called rock bolts so Professor Lance Andersby that was one of the young engineers who has been working with the Citizens Party well he's passed away now but he used to work with the Citizens Party continuously was one of the pioneering, pioneering engineers for the development of hydroelectricity mm. for the Snowy Mountain scheme and all of that sort of stuff. So we can get back to that, but yep. we've got to think in those terms. That's right. Real, real science um, and real development. And while other countries um, such as India are so, and so forth are floundering in terms of getting high-speed rail off the ground, um, countries that were helped by China, such as Indonesia, have really progressed rapidly. So Indonesia has built, it's nearly completed, a 350 kilometre an hour railway line which cuts the time to travel from Jakarta to Bandung down from three hours to 40 minutes. 58% of this particular line is elevated. There's 13 tunnels. Um, this was a project 60% um, done by Indonesia, 40% by the China Railway Engineering Corporation and part of a broader Trans-Java rail network that would connect in eventually to other Belt and Road projects in Southeast Asia. And it's going to be ready for its test run when the November G20 Leaders Summit takes place. So they're very proud of that. Uh, and in Laos too, uh, on the 3rd December last year, Laos opened the 414-kilometre Laos-China Railway, which was built in five years by China. And it will hook in with the Pan-Asian Railway, linking um, Laos to Malaysia with a Kuala Lumpur-Singapore rail connection, which has been agreed to uh, to be built as well. Um, now, of course, <laughs> needless to say, many parties present China going all over the world to build railway lines somehow as a threat. Um, and I was just looking at a um, page from the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, one of these big think tanks that um, promote as, as a threat, but it had some interesting graphs showing the, you know, the amount of rail building that China is doing and the countries where it's taking place and so forth. Um, but as I said, we don't need Chinese loans, we don't need foreign investment from most of which comes from the United States and from Europe to do this. We can actually take a leaf out of China's book and copy the way they do it. Now, how do they do it? Well, they don't use some communist funding mechanism, <laughs> funnily enough, because most of the elements of um, the economic um, planning methods of communism in China have been long since eradicated and the three policy banks that fund these kind of projects in China simply issue credit by putting out, they issue bonds or they borrow from China's central bank hmm. which is the mechanisms used in every Western country. So that's the China Development Bank, the Export Import Bank of China and the Agricultural Development Bank of China. Um, now those banks are strictly regulated, however, so that they don't speculate with that money that they borrow. That money is directed into real development and those policy banks are not beholden to having to generate a profit unlike China's commercial banks. So these are um, 
you know, they're specialised banks that the government can direct to say, all right, we've got this project, just say like in Australia, we've got Iron Boomerang. Had we, did we have, if we had such a bank, the government could say, okay, you issue this amount of credit for this project and it gets done. Yeah, well, the, listen, That's the power the, of government. That's why we talk about the need for a national bank. And in our formulation, our legislation, we call for the National Bank to have $100 billion in capital to start with, which is issued, which is raised through the issuance of debentures or basically loans, you know, taking, you know, um, calling for people to uh, buy bonds. Debentures are just a special type of bond. So $100 billion, just a very, very basic 10 to 1 lending ratio, it's a trillion dollars. Mm. But that, mo that money would then be available for specifically these sorts of projects. Where would the $100 billion come from? Well, there's $3.5 trillion in the superannuation funds, mm. right? So the yeah. government could mandate very quickly, you know, if it had to, it doesn't need to, because I'm sure that that would be, the, these debentures would be gobbled up by the superannuation funds very, very quickly because there'd be a gar government guaranteed return mm. on, that, on those bonds. So this is how you can actually fund real infrastructure. It's not, it's not, um, you know, rocket science in itself, yeah. but it takes the power out of the private <clears throat> banking system and that's what the private yeah. banking system is, you know, terribly worried about that's because right. it just breaks the back of their power. And I mean, that amount of money, you know, in our super and even if you just took a portion of it, you could build every project ever, that's ever been on the books yeah. for this country. I mean, we've documented dozens of water, rail, energy, um, you name it, project, we could be going into space as well yeah. uh, for that, you know, pittance of money. And this, is what, yeah, this is why it's good to see that the, the motion from Glenn Stirl, the Senator, you know, what mm. Malcolm Roberts has put up, this is real nation building development. This is what we need in our country to really transform the country into a more manufacturing based economy instead of a service based economy to utilise and value add our resources instead of just shipping them off, off in ships, develop the steel. We could go to develop aluminium and then, of course, there's other issues too, which we're not covering today, the development of mm. nuclear power. So we actually take the uranium and, and potentially the thorium that we've got, and we're the, the world's largest, we have the world's largest uh, supply of thorium, it's all around us, in mm. fact. We could develop you know, thorium-based nuclear reactors, but we just, we just need that political support yeah. and it's coming. And, you know, with the shortages of energy in the world, you know, oh, there couldn't be a more important absolutely. moment to be talking about those kind of things. And just to follow through, I mentioned earlier that China, since the global financial crisis in 2008, had been pushing to, you know, quite openly just saying, look, obviously what we've done has failed and globalisation needs to be more people-oriented. Our whole approach needs to be oriented to the real economy. They did studies after the GFC saying that there was a split between the real economy and speculation and that had to be rectified and so forth. Um, so since then, they were already beginning to talk within, um, well, shortly thereafter within the BRICS and so forth and things like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and they were beginning to push for those kind of arrangements. But, of course, that was all um, supercharged this year um, when the sanctions were put on Russia and Russia had to try to be independent of the West. But that had already begun in 2014 after the Maidan coup had already seen sanctions levelled against Russia. So um, as early as that was, you know, 2014, China had already been, when that happened, working with Brazil and Russia to begin to bypass the US dollar and conduct trade independently. Um, and that took off after the Maidan coup. But then, as I said, this year... Uh, it really became supercharged and just in the recent period, which we've documented in our Australian Alert Service, and you can contact us for a copy and find out more about that. Um, for instance, Turkey has agreed recently to pay for gas imports in rubles and their banks will use Russia's MIA payments system. India and Russia has just made an agreement to local um, to settle trade with local currencies and there are talks now going on between Indian and Russian banks to use not only the MIA payment system, which is an FPOS mechanism, but to honour the credit card systems of each country in each other's nation. There are discussions to use the MIA, the Russian MIA payment system, with 10 other countries. It's already being used in 11 countries. Russia, with the BRICS and the Eurasian Economic Union, are actually going even further to discuss establishing 
stable long-term producer prices for commodities so that you don't get these soaring prices of commodities like um, discussed in the alert this week where um, some of the Europeans now with the prices of energy going through the roof are criticising the fact that on the, um, the TFF exchange in the Netherlands, which is spot market for gas and energy trading, you have a hundred times the amount of gas traded than what is actually physically that physically changes hands. So they're finally beginning to switch on to something we've been talking about for decades. Uh, and I'll also mention that right now the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is meeting in Uzbekistan and President Putin of Russia, Xi of China and Modi of India are all physically present there. And this follows upon the Eastern Economic Forum that just took place in Russia, um, which we'll be reporting on mm. further next week because these kind of agreements um, that say, well, all right, the US dollar system's locking us out, well, we have to forge on ahead. But, you know, we can't end up having a world characterised by two segregated economic blocks, and that's why it's crucial that we get the Western nations talking to these other nations that are moving in this direction, uh, something like an international conference on the scale of the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, where Roosevelt you know, identified the same problem and knew mm -hmm. we had to have an integrated framework which all the major nations agreed to and helped to uplift the developing countries to bring them into that same orbit um, that we can all work together because we're all on the same planet. We all ultimately need the same things as human beings. And that's what our policy is. That's our international policy for peace and development. And a new Bretton Woods Conference, bring people together, have one system, but mm. also respect the sovereignty of, in, uh, of each country's currencies. Now, we've had a unipolar system for post-war period, you know, centred on the US dollar. That could have worked quite fine, but it's been weaponised mm. and it's been used as a tool to beat down developing nations and so forth. That's all breaking apart because with the, with the rise of China and China's internal development, the work of uh, President Putin since 2000 in protecting his economy and people mm -hmm. from the ravages of the neo, uh, neoliberal policies and trying to, to, to bring about internal development and the collaboration between those two great countries You've seen that the US, that this, this so idea for uni, uh, unipolar mm. break apart. And yeah. other countries don't want to be participating in the brutality of what the United States has demonstrated over the last 50 years. Mm. We don't want this stuff, they say. And if you have a look at the financial policies of the World Bank, of the International Monetary Fund and so forth, and how they've used the, the US dollar and debt, uh, you know, the debt, um, debt mechanism so mm. forth uh, internationally, they don't want it. Mm. So this is a, this is like coming in more and more as it's uh, more and more accepted. And you mm. can see this through all these different uh, international meetings and so forth that yeah. being supported by more and more countries. And speaking of that unipolar order, we're going to come to that now in the next segment because, uh, well, it's called the twisted fraud justifying war in the name of democracy. So this comes to the very nature of the rules-based order that, you know, the unipolar world order represents, which was really a sidelining of international law to bring in our rules of the Anglo-Americans. Um, and of course what they've couched it in terms of is the very all-important issue of democracies versus autocracies. Uh, and of course we can see this mentality plunging us headlong into a new world war against the so-called authoritarian monsters of China and Russia. Um, so there's an article this week, again, you can contact us for a copy or you can subscribe to get it regularly. Uh, in this week's alerts called The Birth of the Democracy and Rule of Law Swindle. Mm. And so it goes through how the US, UK and NATO are using, um, I mean, you know, they're quite happy actually that Russia launched this special military operation uh, in Ukraine, which Russia had to do to protect its people. Um, because they're using it, that Anglo-American nexus is using it to firstly strip Russia of any future ability to fight against a major adversary. And the US um, Defence Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin admitted as much saying, you know, we want to wear Russia down through this war. Um, so that's why they keep supplying Ukraine weapons to no end. Um, Secondly, to knock Moscow out of the equation when a fighting war with China begins and basically 
from everything we're hearing at the moment and historically um, the Americans believe and Anglo-Americans, NATO more broadly believe that war with China is inevitable again as you said from the rise of China because uh, the concept of Britain and the US is that they would not allow a rival ever to challenge them again as the Soviet Union was once capable of doing. So the mantra was developed in order to justify this about democracy and the rule of law. Democracy overtook development as the key goal enunciated by US governments, especially under Jimmy Carter with um, the National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski dictating the whole um, uh, you know, pitting one against the other, the arc of crisis strategy to keep Russia in check. Um, but this push was particularly escalated for democracy, you know, versus the autocracies in 2004 to 2007 under a project called the Princeton Project on National Security, which is the subject of the article in the Alert Service. Now, this Princeton Project was funded by key think tanks, um, we won't go into all the details of that now, but they consulted, these think tanks consulted and the project consulted with people like Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger. And in their 2006 final report, um, and this is in a nutshell defines what it was all about, the headline is Forging a World of Liberty Under Law, US National Security in the 21st Century. Um, it said that the US was, quote, lacking a single organising principle for foreign policy like anti-fascism, or anti-communism. In other words, they had to go out in search of an enemy image to provide to people. An easily marketable enemy, enemy image. Mm -hmm. yeah. They said the project go project's goal was to build a consensus for a new global crusade against all opponents of the liberal world order. Neoliberal world order, which means policies that destroy nation states and provide the necessary uh, revenue streams for the private banking international private banking oligarchy, mm -hmm. the banker's dictatorship as we refer to it too. That's right. And the interlinked other goal was to form a new concert of democracies. So again, as I said, sidelining um, the recognised international authorities and bodies such as the United Nations that emerged after World War II. And it explicitly says, this is a quote, if the United Nations cannot be reformed, the concert would provide an alternative forum for liberal democracies to authorise collective action, including the use of force by a supermajority vote. Its membership would be selective, it goes on to say. Um, and it then calls for reviving the NATO alliance by updating its grand bargains and expanding its international partnerships, building a networked order of informal institutions, think AUKUS and so forth, uh, such as private networks and bilateral ties. So this is exactly what's been going on. And then it says that at their core... Both liberty and law must be backed up by force. Or wars. And it says forging a world of liberty under law means understanding the role of force in upholding the law and enforcing the order necessary for liberty to flourish. Uh, and then in specific cases, the preemptive and even preventive use of force may be necessary. I mean, this yeah. defines all their regime change wars, which supposedly were necessary preventatively or preemptively to protect us, such as from Saddam Hussein's yeah. weapons of mass destruction, right? Yeah, well, those lies. I mean, this is this is a so-called democracy at work here, right? And, and people get very cynical about, well, just take, take, take have a look at what's happened in our country under Scott Morrison. Look at the uh, look at the uh, the lies mm. that have come out. Look at the lies within the banking system, the Royal Commission. This is a great democracy. The at secret work. ministries. Yeah, secret <laughs> secret ministries. You know. Uh, oh, great. You know, so I don't think we can throw stones here. We live in too much of a glass house. So, least. so this is the great idea of democracy that mm. they put up here, as opposed to the autocracies. You know, why do you need to use force? to protect democracy if it's what the people want. Well, that's the point. It might, what the people want, maybe not what, it's not what the majority of the financiers want, the bankers want. I mean, look what's happening in our country right now with the increasing interest rates. Look what's mm. happening with the, the, the economic collapse of our country based upon the fact that we're a service country, a service economy. Do you think that people want war with China? Of course they don't, mm. right? But this is what's being pushed upon us by 
this policy? Well, it's funny because people in Australia, according to polls that came out recently, are more afraid of a war, that a war in China is likely to happen than people in Taiwan. Yeah. You know, so that you see the propaganda in nations like Australia has absolutely spun out of control because of this kind of agenda um, to, to block what I was talking about earlier and what you discussed of, you know, beginnings of a multipolar order to mm. begin to have more countries... Every country have their say in how the world system operates rather than a, you know, one or two countries dictating a unipolar order and that's very close to breaking out. And I just wanted to mention with one last plug for the uh, Australian Alert Service because obviously the um, human rights, um, the discussion of human rights abuses by China, especially in Xinjiang, is another way that that charge is being levelled against countries like China or we can't work with them on these economic projects because they're human rights abusers and so forth. And of course, we had this report that was issued um, by the United Nations on Xinjiang, which Michelle Bachelet did not put her name to, and we talked about that in length last week, so you can go back to look at last week's show. Um, but I wanted to call out to the article written in the Alert Service this week by Richard Barden, which is our initial analysis. Of course, the report that the UN issued did not even say unequivocally that crimes against humanity are being committed, only that undefined crimes may have occurred. And in order to do this, to make that weak charge as, as much as it is, they emit numerous prominent countervailing opinions from international experts. They deliberately misrepresent Chinese laws and government policy statements and downplay the seriousness of the terrorist attacks that prompted China's actions in Xinjiang, um, you know, to do what they did to prevent the horrific terrorist attacks that had been occurring, which we've seen how the West reacts to terrorist attacks, um, many of which have not been nearly as bad as those ones experienced in that area. Mm. Um, now, there's going to be more said about that, and I, I do want to urge everybody to um, hit that notification bell when you subscribe on YouTube because uh, we're going to be putting out another Citizens Insight show, which you'll be alerted of. It should be out sometime in the next week um, with the first um, exclusive interview uh, with Jack James, who is one of the key individuals who has done legal analysis of um, some of the reports coming out of ASPE, mm -hmm. um, such as the Uyghur, the famous report they did on the Uyghurs, um, which, uh, you know, really strips apart the, the fact that, well, any, any legitimacy of the allegations made in that report and shows the academic fraud that actually has been conducted in order to slam China on things of this nature. You know, the, the, the need for peace is being threatened by the level of these lies. And right now, if we want to deal with an oncoming global financial breakdown, which will be on a much bigger scale than what happened in 2008, because not only did we not solve the problems since then, we exacerbated them. Everything we've done, pumping out the quantitative easing, has boosted all those speculative bubbles, no end. And the only way to build out of such an economic financial breakdown is with grand development projects, putting people to work, reconstructing the infrastructure and economic capacities that we need to live through a crisis. If people thought the last couple of years with COVID and so forth was bad with supply lines and so forth, you know, face a global economic breakdown on the scale we're looking at, uh, of course, war would be a whole nother level beyond uh, even our worst imagination. And there's one other thing, Elisa, which is very important here that we do as a party, and that is we call out the lies, we call out the deception, and we call out this the, the, the people behind who are pushing for this war. And we'll do it very loudly. Because, look, if you go back to the era of McCarthyism in the United States, right, people were intimidated, they were jailed, they were, they were afraid to speak up so-called freedom of speech mm. democracy, right? And it wasn't until there was a news presenter, I can't quite remember his name at the moment, got up very quietly and said that this is rubbish, this is not true, and it broke the back of McCarthyism. In, you know, he, he pointed to, to, to the operations that were done in order to create this uh, terror campaign. 
Now, that's what's happening in Australia with the Chinese. Now, we've been, we've been, we can go back to 1996 for our support for the Eurasian Land Bridge, for the, for the, 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 which became the Belt Silk and Road. Silk Road and, and, yeah. and so forth, the Silk Road um, ideas and so forth. So we're not deviating from anything mm. that we've supported in the last 30 years. So we're not going to tolerate, as a political organisation, anyone that spreads lies, deception, and attacks China on the basis of these lies. Mm -hmm. And if that means that we have to become uh, the only voice to do it, then we shall do that. And if people say we're funded by Beijing or something, well, you can say it as much as you want. It's not the true. The Australian Electoral Commission knows it's not true because yeah. we're a very transparent um, political party and have to abide by those rules. So, you know, they can say what they want. We'll continue to fight for the truth. That's, that's why I think uh, Jack James' interview is a must, much needed added uh, um, uh, expose mm. to our work because it gives people the truth of what's going on. And this is the problem. The major media, ABC in particular, they've got a political agenda. You know, SBS. We've seen we've been attacked on SBS, or Robbie, your co-presenter, has been attacked on SB, SBS. We've seen the attacks from Sky News. We've, and the Murdoch media is disgusting. It always has been. It's the war-mongering media. media. Mm -hmm. It promoted the Iraq war and so forth. We represent an alternative news channel to get out the actual necessary information, which is fact-based, in order for people to make proper decisions. And without us, there wouldn't be anywhere else to mm. go. No, that's right. So join us in the fight. <laughs> get um, a copy of our alert. Get online. Click on the links below. Don't forget to sign Dale Webster's petition. That's probably your first thing to do. And then look up that um, media release on contacting your councillors about the postal bank. Um, and if you want more information or any, any help on what you can do, give us a call on our toll-free number. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Alyssa. Thanks for tuning in and see you next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.